Hi, everybody. My name is Atusa Abrahamian. I am a journalist and the author of a book called The Cosmopolites, The Coming of the Global Citizen. Um, it's out in French and in Italian as well, if that's your native language. And uh, today we're going to be talking about passports. So um, passports and citizenship uh, have become totally commodified. Uh, they're now a product that you can buy the same way that you would buy some shoes if someone made you get a background check to buy shoes. And uh, it's a big business. And so I think it's quite, re it's quite relevant to the work that a lot of you do because you'll notice more and more people showing up with St. Kitts passports. And they don't really have anything necessarily to do with St. Kitts. So first, I like to start with my favorite quote. It's by Herman Melville from Moby Dick. And so, of course, everybody knows here that, uh, you know, we can cross borders, sin can cross borders without a passport. But what Melville did not point out and couldn't have known at the time is that a passport can help sin move around even more freely. Uh, I'm not talking about fake passports. That's just something to keep in mind. Um, the presentation I'm going to give is only about the legal side of selling citizenship. Uh, this means that there are laws allowing it, that there are people who are certified to do it or licensed. Um, you know, fakes are a dime a dozen, and from my perspective, it's not as interesting. Although, big problem. So, the citizenship historically has been seen as sacred, something um, intangibly special, uh, something that ties you to a, a birthplace or, or a heritage. Um, but in the, in the 80s, uh, three things contributed to the emergence of a market for citizenship. Uh, the first is that small colonies, or former colonies, sorry, became independent. Um, this led to uh, a great need for funds. Uh, island economies especially didn't really have a whole lot going for them um, besides the service sector. And then you also had something I call citizenship anxiety, um, which was also a product of decolonization. Um, I think that in particular uh, in China, people became quite nervous after uh, Tiananmen Square, started to look for another passport. Um, and British officials also at the time were floating a half-baked plan to relocate 5 million Hong Kong citizens to Northern Ireland. So even back in the day, it was something, you know, what, what do we do with people once the country that they think they're part of is no longer part of the country it used to be part of? So it gets kind of complicated. Um, so the market started to grow in the 80s and 90s. And sorry, I'm clicking there and also looking at my notes, so a little, little uncoordinated. Um, so the market uh, emerged in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, Canada was the first to pass immigrant investor legislation, uh, still going, very popular. Uh, Caribbean countries began to put citizenship by investment provisions in their laws. Uh, and then some weird stuff was also going on in the Pacific Islands. Uh, Tonga, Samoa, the Marshall Islands, Vanuatu, Ven and Nauru all set up really shady schemes that brought in a combined $152 million. Uh, mostly this came from Chinese buyers and they were looking for an exit or a tax passport between 82 and 97. And then finally in 1990, the US Congress passed the Immigration Act, which allows rich foreigners to spend half a million to a million bucks and then effectively get a green card. That's not the same as buying citizenship, but it's it's kind of its cousin. Um, and I think that it's also a big part of the landscape of buying citizenship and residence. Uh, since 2001, when 9-11 happened, uh, there have been a lot more security, um, concerns about security. And that's, that's when the market for citizenship uh, really began to professionalize, uh, proliferate. Marketing came into play. People, countries would actually advertise. Um, and middlemen were really instrumental in creating this market. Uh, now it's a $2 billion business, according to Bloomberg. So I'll run you through the options. I don't know if anyone's in the market for one, but those are the current options. Um, you have St. Kitts, by far the most popular of all of them, uh, just in terms of numbers. Um, you can get, you can buy a condo for four hundred thousand dollars, and they throw in a passport for free. It's, you know, it's pretty nice if you're that kind of person. Um, Malta is about a million dollars. Cyprus is two million. They recently lowered the price. 
uh, Dominica 200K, Grenada 200K. So, you know, you see a lot of places that also conveniently double as offshore centers or tax havens. I guess if you're going to visit your money, or if you're going to be a citizen, you might as well also be able to put your money there. And, and then there's investor visas. Virtually every developed country and virtually every Western country um, has some version of immigrant investor legislation. This is, uh, this is how it's presented. Um, you know, you can almost, you can't, you can't, it's not like you can buy it on Amazon, but you were getting there, maybe with Bitcoin one day. Um, one notable, yeah. Oh yeah, I'll get into that later, but it's uh, one of the middle, the companies that are middlemen in this market and they have a ranking and they can, they show you all the options, so. Um, so the, the countries I just showed on the slide are the official programs. They're, you know, they're pretty well regarded, I guess. Uh, some people slip through the cracks. It's not totally 100% clean, but um, generally speaking, if you go to the U.S. border with a St. Kitts passport and you, you don't have any other flags um, and you have your visa, you're probably in good shape. Uh, one country that did something very strange, and I, it's kind of tangential, but I think it's worth mentioning, is the Comoro Islands. Now, the, the Comoros are three islands in the Indian Ocean. There's a fourth Comoro Island that is part of France. Um, they became independent and, and then were in the 80s and then, became, then were run by mercenaries, by French mercenaries. Um, the Comoro Islands don't have a particularly desirable passport, but just to show the effect of this, the passport market on not just rich people, but everybody, um, I'm going to tell you a story. So in 2006, 2007, the United Arab Emirates decided that they wanted to solve the problem that they have in their country. There are a lot of stateless people that have no nationality. No one's giving them citizenship. The UAE doesn't want to give them citizenship because, you know, their citizenship comes with a lot of benefits. But they're stateless, and the UN's getting on their case saying, guys, you can't just have all these stateless people in your country. You have to document them and give them certain rights. So the UAE thought about it a bit, and this middleman came into the picture, this Syrian French guy. And um, he said, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we buy passports for the stateless people? And they thought, oh, OK, um, we have lots of money. We can buy passports. Uh, and the middleman wound up striking a deal with the Comoro Islands. Uh, in exchange for $200 million, the Comoros provided um, more than this, but the, the deal was that the Comoros would provide passports for 4,000, sorry, 4,000 stateless families. So the result is that in the UAE, you have lots of formerly stateless people uh, carrying citizenship of a country that they have never been to and possibly never even heard of. Um, I've been talking a bunch about the middlemen in this market, so I'm going to give you a, these are the, the main ones. Um, Henley & Partners is, the, is a Swiss company. They have offices all over the place. They're pretty um, prominent. And if you, I think if you Google citizenship by investment, they might be the first on the list. Uh, I think that they, by my assessment, they were really, really important in turning the, the market for passports, um, taking it from something that was like a James Bond kind of character to something that's almost closer to an Amex gold card. You know, you buy your passport, you have this status. Um, CS Global is the name of another company that's very active in the Caribbean. Art and Capital is, um, the, the CEO is like, has like six or eight passports. Uh, they all, all of the CEOs of these companies have loads of passports. Um, and they're out of Canada. Uh, then you have boutique agencies, and increasingly, you have, there's a big network of local agents in China. Um, I don't speak uh, Mandarin or Cantonese or, or any of the local languages, so I haven't been able to dig into it, but uh, I, I hear it's really growing. So you're probably asking yourself, why would anyone want to buy a passport? Um, sometimes it's ne necessary to dissemble one's nationality, as Ellen Voss said. So, official reasons according to the middlemen and the people who are buying, are pretty straightforward. Uh, mobility, you can travel without a visa to lots of countries. If you have a Libyan or a Russian passport, that's a really big deal. You don't want to always be going to embassies getting visas. Quality of life, you know, um, again, Canada, or sorry, St. Kitts is probably nicer than any number of war-torn places. 
um, security, healthcare, tax, and succession planning. Although it depends where you're coming from in the first place, the tax stuff um, is a lot more beneficial to, say, former Americans than it is to people from countries that don't tax um, extraterritorially. So that's the, those are the official reasons. Um, then you have the unofficial reasons, which uh, come into play quite a bit. Uh, when you obtain another passport, and say, say you're, you're from Russia, um, you know, you spell your name in Cyrillic, uh, and you get another passport, and maybe you can slightly tweak the spelling. Uh, when you tweak the spelling, maybe you don't show up um, in the background checks as much. Maybe, you know, on Google, you're not, you're not the same person. It's kind of, it's not like having a fully new identity, but it can help, you know, get rid of your past a little bit. Um, you can also be a politically exposed person. Having another citizenship can help you run away if you're in trouble. Um, if you want to get around capital controls in the instance of, of China, that I hear it's quite a big thing um, if you want to, you know, take money out of the country. Um, and so there's, all, oh, and also FATCA. FATCA has been uh, one of the drivers of Americans buying another citizenship because the only way to uh, escape from the IRS for good is to renounce your American citizenship and then get an, you can't be stateless unless you want to be stateless, I don't recommend it. Um, I buy another citizenship to replace your American one. So I have, it's rare, it's really not as much as you'd think, but I have talked to some people who were American, uh, renounced, got a St. Kitts passport or another passport and then, you know, led perfectly happy lives outside the United States. Who are these people? Well, here's a, a cast of characters. This guy. This is, uh, this is Adam Bilzerian. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Bilzerians. Um, his father's very famous guy who owes the SEC $62 million. He got out of prison and he's in St. Kitts too now. They have a kind of a family business helping people buy citizenship. It's, um, as you can tell, very, very, very upstanding. Um, Bitcoin Jesus. This guy is called Roger. Oh, sorry, that, so you, that was Bilzerian. This is Roger Veer. He is one of the first people to have invested in Bitcoin. He made a lot of money, um, but he's also a very, very, very staunch libertarian, and he really doesn't like American regulation or taxes. And he'll admit this. Um, so he, he had a kind of a checkered past. He, was, he served some time for selling explosives on the internet. He ran for Congress on a libertarian, not for Congress, he ran for local office in California on a libertarian platform, at some point decided he was done with the US. So he bought a St. Kitts condo, uh, got a passport, and renounced his American citizenship. He says he's very happy. He spends some time in Japan, too. Pavel Durov, he is the, um, the co-founder of Vkontakte, which is a Russian Facebook. Uh, he, oh, sorry, sorry. This is Pavel Durov. That's Pavel. Um, he is also a St. Kitts citizen. Um, the real, the American Facebook uh, also has a uh, former American and St. Kitts citizen, Ed, Sa sorry, Singaporean citizen, sorry, my slides are all screwed up. Can I go back? Yeah, Ed Saverin is a former American, also Brazilian citizen, who took advantage of Singapore's residence by investment program to leave the U.S. shortly before Facebook IPO'd. I think it worked out pretty well for him. It's Pavel again. Uh, Thaksin Shinawat, former Thai leader, um, at some point had to, oh, he had to leave the country because he was in trouble, and he resurfaced with a passport from Montenegro. Uh, Montenegro had a short-lived uh, citizenship by investment scheme, which ended shortly after Thaksin was, you know, revealed to be actually from Montenegro. Uh, Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel recently bought a lake house in New Zealand and under some obscure provision of New Zealand law was able to obtain New Zealand citizenship. Normally it's for people who do great humanitarian things um, and Peter Thiel was just really rich. So the, the, the saying is America first and New Zealand second since he's a Trump advisor. And uh, this guy, Ihor Kolomoisky. This is like my favorite um, passport joke. Some uh, some journalists asked him in 2014, he's, a, he's by the way, he's a, a former governor of a province in Ukraine, and he's a, a banker. And a journalist asked him in an interview about how he had Ukrainian, Israeli, and Cypriot citizenship. 
wonder how he got the Cypriot one, right? Uh, the, the journalist said that dual nationality is prohibited by the Ukrainian constitution. And what did Mr. Kolomoisky say? He said, yes, but it does not say anything about triple nationality. <laughs> um, so, but this actually raises uh, an interesting question, which is, can you have two passports? Can you have three passports? Can you have six? I've met people with eight. Um, and the answer is it depends on the country. Uh, if you're getting your passports um, by investment and the countries typically when you get a, typically the countries that offer citizenship by investment don't, re don't require you to renounce your other one. If they're not asking you to renounce when you naturalize, uh, it's not a big deal. Also, countries don't typically share lists of their citizens to make sure nobody's breaking that rule. Um, dual citizens, triple citizens, while they are more and more common, they're not by any means the majority of the population. So I think they're not a huge concern uh, diplomatically. Um, and so I, this is a really, really big business. And to give a sense of how big the business is, I want to run you through what happened in St. Kitts and Nevis uh, because it kind of pulls together all of the, the issues in citizenship by investment. So St. Kitts, former colony, um, in 1983 passed immigrant investor legislation uh, allowing for the sale of passports. Um, but the program was pretty much dormant for, for 20, 30 years uh, until 2006. And that's when a Swiss guy named Chris Kalin came along and he was working for a firm called Henley and Partners. It's, uh, they, at the time, the company did a lot of estate planning, tax optimization, and this guy, Chris, uh, he saw a, a business opportunity because he was dealing with clients who maybe wanted to, you know, have another passport for security reasons, for tax reasons, what have you. And he started to work with the government um, to relaunch their citizenship by investment program. Uh, they would have to donate $200,000, uh, which is flat out donate, um, and he also structured a program where they could buy a house, buy an apartment, or buy a condo, and um, get a citizenship with that. The biggest thing that he did, though, I think, was to rebrand the concept of citizenship by investment. Like I said, it's, it you know, sounds really sketchy, I bought a passport, and yet, uh, now if you open a weekend issue of the Financial Times, you might see it a full pullout ad for citizenship in Antigua and St. Kitts. It's, you know, again, he was very good at pushing this as a luxury item. Um, real estate has been a big component, as I mentioned, and you've got some big players getting involved. You've got, in St. Kitts, you've got the Marriott, the Four Seasons. Um, in Antigua, I think you've got a couple of them popping up too. Um, and in St. Kitts, that could be your home. Um, and uh, actually for St. Kitts, it worked out economically, at least on paper, it worked out quite well. Um, in 2015, the IMF put in their report, the inflows to the real estate sector are fueling a construction boom. It's pulled the economy out of a four-year recession. It helped them cut their debt. Um, in 2013, it was 20, passport sales were 25% of GDP. And that was only the processing fees. That wasn't all of the secondary stuff. Uh, in 2014, I, this is my back of the envelope calculations, their biggest export uh, was passports. And between 2006, when Henley and Partners and the Swiss guy Chris got involved, um, almost 11,000 passports were sold. So that's a lot. You're probably asking yourself, what if all of these kitticians want to go to St. Kitts? Will there be space for them? A lot of them bought houses, so they could uh, theoretically live in their houses. But it's worth pointing out that you don't even have to go to St. Kitts to become a citizen. You can do this all by phone, by email. You can meet immigration agents abroad. There was for a while a scheme where you could actually buy real estate in Dubai, or, or in, no, not in Dubai, in the UAE, and that would qualify you for St. Kitts citizenship. Basically, this whole business has, has really blown up, and, and you have very weird permutations of it. Um, and then there's also the question of where the money is going. Uh, St. Kitts structured theirs in a way that if you donate the money, if you just give them 400 grand, uh, the, do the money goes into a fund called the Sugar, in uh, Sugar Industry Diversification Fund, ostensibly a fund that is supposed to re-educate and, and help out former sugar workers who formed the backbone of their economy for a long time. Um, we don't have full accounting. Uh, the transparency is pretty limited. They're getting better, but the, you, we don't have the full accounting. That's, there's no other way to put it. 
Um, most programs won't come out and say we sold X many passports because it sounds weird. Um, there are all these rumors that passports were sold to terrorists and Syrians and then um, there also the background checks raise some questions because as I said earlier, if you're, you spell your name in Russian one way and then maybe you are also you know, active in France and you spell your name in French another way, you can fall through the cracks and um, if you're just doing straight normal background checks with, with software, this doesn't always come up. Um, Uh, Antigua recently released a breakdown of who is applying to their citizenship by investment, which is very similar to St. Kitts, similar story to outside company came in. Um, and so China is a big, a big buyer. Hungary, India, Indonesia, Iran. Some countries have banned Iran because they don't want to get into trouble with other countries. Um, Lebanon, Russia. So I'm not sure, I don't think that the others um, come from any particular region. I, that's the way the graph is constructed. So I mentioned a company called Henley and Partners. Uh, as soon as they started to get a lot of success in St. Kitts, they got some competition. Uh, this is a magazine or one of those pull-out ads in the FT that I mentioned, um, sponsored by a company called CS Global. Is this CS Global? Yeah, and they're you know look at look at the marketing. I mean, it's it's like you're buying a Rolex or some sort of uh, frequent flyer card. Uh, it's, it's very strange to me that citizenship is being advertised with a woman in a bikini uh, on a boat, but that's, that's the world we live in. <laughs> yeah, mar marketing has been a, a really big thing. And the um, paradise starts here. Um, passport companies, or the, what I call them, the, the middlemen, um, also do uh, these yearly passport rankings where they say this is the best passport, this is the worst passport. Uh, and, you know, the subtext being we can help you buy one of the best passports come to us. The rankings vary obviously by company, but usually it's based on how many countries you can go to visa free. Uh, so Denmark's great, Germany's great, and then Pakistan, Iran, and China are not so good. The other element of marketing passports that I found very interesting is that they were marketed as a way to be more global. Um, since I first, since I wrote the book, uh, the idea of being a global citizen has, um, it's a lot more political now and it's maybe not as popular as it used to be, but when you pitch people by saying be a global citizen, it sounds a lot better than, than buy a passport. This is um, an ad for one of the other, the companies that does that. Are you a global citizen? So it's really it's really um, targeting the jet set business class. Um, there's been some fallout from these programs. Uh, you guys probably know about this, but FinCEN put out a directive a few years ago saying you can use uh, citizenship by investment programs, specifically St. Kitts, uh, to you know launder money. So watch out. If you have a client with um, you know, St. Kitts passport, there might be something more to it. If you search for Dominica's citizenship by investment program on WikiLeaks, you're gonna find some really fun stuff. Uh, there was a guy called Roman Lakshin who was a Dominican economic citizen and he, he got into all kinds of trouble all over the world. Um, and, but the thing is, there's nothing you can really do to stop countries from selling their citizenship. What, you, what, country, what other countries can do is, by, is, is to impose visa restrictions, uh, which is effective because it lowers the value of the passport and makes it less attractive to buy. Um, but you know, besides, you, no country can compel another country to change their immigration law uh, in quite this way. So it's like whack-a-mole if, you know, if, you, if you have one country and they, they, start to, they sell too many passports, other countries can gang up on them, but then another one is gonna pop up and it's, People have described it as a race to the bottom, and I don't think that's totally inaccurate. Um, yeah, I mentioned before there was a sort of nationalist backlash now. Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, said very memorably that if you're a citizen of everywhere, you're a citizen of nowhere. Um, and that's, yeah, sorry, we went over this. That's, looks like I'm missing some slides, but Sorry about that. Well, if you guys have any questions, uh, that's my book. It's called The Cosmopolites. I'm on Twitter. That's my um, website, and I'm here. So.
<laughs> okay. Our emergency's government never planned to relocate or actually get more It was a half baked plan. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a real it wasn't I don't I don't think Definitely, definitely. That that was exactly when these things started to crop up. Over there? Does the US have any specific rules on how many passports of citizens get to I don't think so. I think that the US allows dual citizenship and, and I suppose no, triples. No, mm -hmm. so no but but effectively and you don't have I know so many people who have two passports, one American, one foreign, and it doesn't really Maybe officially, maybe, so here, I'll go over this actually. When you become a US citizen through naturalization, part of the oath is that you renounce all allegiance to other countries, yada, yada, yada. Um, but this is not enforced. They're not asking you to actually cut up your old passport. Right. It would be very difficult. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, in a couple of the Caribbean, in Antigua and St. Kitts, when you resell your condo after um, three to five years, you can then attach another, a new, fresh passport uh, to the sale of the condo again. So it's a qualified property, and it rem it will remain so um, until the rules change. Yeah, you can even make money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I asked some officials how many denials have you issued, and uh, it was a few years ago, but they said, you know, not, not that many. <laughs> yes.
It's true. Before the foreign company got involved, it was people say it was basically dormant. Probably there were people coming and going. Um, it was. I will say with confidence, it was much smaller than it is now. Uh, if you go to St. Kitts today, you drive around, there is so much construction, and at every corner there's an ad for citizenship by investment. It's actually creating some problems because um, it's re raising the cost of real estate. Uh, you have these, in, these condos that are really not that expensive or, or nice, but their value is inflated because they come with citizenship. Uh, and then the people on the locals don't can't afford to pay the rent on these condos And so what that's gonna bring long term uh, remains to be seen But there's definitely a kind of a bubble effect in the real estate business because of it um, I think it's a normal passport renewal you probably do it by mail um, in Antigua you can Sorry, a few of these countries also um, extend the citizenship to your children. Uh, if they're adult children or if they're grown, you have to pay when you're applying, but then if they're born afterwards, you, they are entitled to citizenship uh, when they're born. Um, anecdotally, yeah, I've heard lots of rumors and uh, some more credible reports. I don't get into that in my book because that seems to be pretty clearly corruption and not part of the legal programs. Um, a diplomatic passport is even better than a, a regular old St. Kitts passport because you have certain protections and immunities. And so you can see why there would be a black market for those. Anybody else? Great. Thank you for listening. Oh, sorry, there's one more, one more. <laughs> there are some passports, particularly in that that are being sold out of Washington, D.C. Mm. by some lawyers who purported to represent them. And the narrow people never got the money for the passports. And they didn't get the records of who got the passports. Was that in the 80s, the 90s? This was in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, and that speaks to the fact that the people who win the most in this whole equation are the middlemen, because they're, they're getting money from the government, from their clients, and they don't really have to live with the consequences. <laughs>